What's up, everybody? I am so excited that you're here today to join us with Dr. Jeff Lewin. I know that many of you registered for this webinar a month ago. We're so excited that we are doing this live and in person now. Dr. Jeff is one of my all-time favorite people and one of those people I have known since the very beginning of my chiropractic, um, you know, started in this profession 12 years ago. For those of you who have not had the privilege of hearing him speak in person, I am so sorry. Contact your state association and rectify that. Or if you've never met him in person, he is just one of the most genuine, salt of the earth, unbelievable um, people I have ever met. Not to mention his vast depth of knowledge in the areas of practice growth, billing, coding, documentation, and of course, my all-time favorite, compliance. <laughs> uh, I know, I am the odd man out on that uh, one. You and I are both weirdos in that regard, that we actually get excited about compliance. <laughs> I do. I get so excited about compliance. They're used to it because I talk about it all the time. We could be talking about, let's do a webinar on underwater basket weeding, but let's talk about the compliance of it first. That's right. <laughs> but I'm super excited to have you here today. Jeff, I just, you know, I'm so excited and I love this topic of conversation because as we know in chiropractic, documentation is a big area of risk. Yes. And I think there are so many people who try to overcomplicate the matter um, and it doesn't have to be that complicated. And I think that, you know, the beginning of trying to make sure that your documentation is where it needs to be is to learn from the mistakes of other people. Like, what are you seeing out there as a coach mm -hmm. and as somebody who does chart audits? And so I'm so excited about this webinar. So thank you. Absolutely. And, and one of the things that I, I try to uh, pride myself on when I, when I make presentations such as this is not to be just another talking head saying, this is what you need to do for a compliance soap note. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it real. And I'm going to share some, some stories with you all. Uh, these stories are real stories, but I have for sure changed a lot of the identifying facts to protect the guilty. So um, you'll, you'll hear me ref referencing a doctor in a certain state. I promise you that doctor is not in that state. Nobody will be able to understand who that person is. So uh, I, I think that you'll really enjoy this type of a presentation. I got a ton of material to get through today. So as you'll see, don't sit there and scramble to try to jot down every note about everything I'm talking about. Um, you can see my email address here on the, uh, on the title slide. I'll have another slide up. Uh, you can send me an email. Uh, I will send you a reproduction of every slide that's going to be here on the presentation. I'm also going to be talking about a couple of little goodies, some tools and resources that I will be very happy to send to you as well. Just send me an email. Say that you want uh, the information from avoiding the most expensive documentation mistakes, or you can just simply say from today's Chusa webinar, and I will send that over to you. I will not spam you. I will not market you. I will not sell your information to anybody. I will just give you exactly what it is that you're looking for, and hopefully you'll appreciate that. So is there anything else that you need to cover or are we ready to jump into things? It's all you. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, Christy gave a quick intro as to who I am. Uh, I graduated from the school formerly known as New York Chiropractic College back in 1989. I like to joke around. It's like, yeah, do you believe that they gave me a license to practice when I was 11? Um, I established also, if it wasn't the first, it was certainly one of the first multidisciplinary practices in the state of Florida, which is where I practiced. Uh, I'm, I live in Boca Raton, so if you're ever down here in South Florida, hit me up and say a quick hi. I've had a total of five practices in my career uh, of varying different types, whether they be multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary with a sports uh, slant to it, and I had to, two practices that were purely cash-based sports-oriented practices. Uh, I've been a coach for chiropractors for the past 24, going on 25 years, and what most people who know me know is that I practice, I, I focus on solutions. I don't like to monger in fear. So that is something that I, I take a lot of pride in. I want to make sure that we can finish this, this webinar over the next hour or so. And you're going to walk away with practical information that you can put in use in your practice quite literally today. And first and foremost, I'm not the police. So if anybody has any questions, 
feel free to reach out to me. Here's my email address so I can uh, you can jot that down or take a little picture of it and email me after the webinar. I'll be happy to send over my information. And also, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to schedule a call uh, with you. No charge, no obligation to address any, any particular questions that you might have. It'd be my pleasure. So again, this material is not meant to invoke fear. It's meant to inform you and to give you knowledge. And with knowledge, there is power. So if you know where your pain points are, if you know where the weak spots are in your systems, you can take specific action now and turn those relative weaknesses into potential strengths. And this way you can approach your practice from a position of power. And hopefully you're going to see that the topics that we're going to be talking about today don't have to be hard to implement. So let's take a little step back in time and remember that we've come a long, long way in our profession. And those of you who've been in practice, oh, more than 10 years, certainly more than 20 years, we can think back to the days where there was absolutely no standardization in terms of documentation. I remember when I first went in, uh, into practice as an associate, the, the very first day I'm, I'm sitting in the, uh, my doctor's office and uh, I'm sitting next to one of his other associates and the owner doc comes in and tosses a chart at me and says, write up today's notes. And I look at him like, what do I put? He's like, just write it up. And he leaves the room. So I look next to me at the other associate and I said, so what do I say? And he's like, oh, just put SSSQ. I go, SSSQ. He's like, oh yeah, signs and symptoms, status quo. And that back in 1989 and 1990 was enough to get paid and get paid well. There was not a lot of documentation that was required. And back in those days, if people had good insurance, they had 80-20 coverage with a $100 deductible. And that's 80-20, 80% of your fee, not of some arbitrary fee schedule. And if you had bad insurance, you had that same 80-20, but you had a whopping $250 deductible. And quite literally, it was like taking what we called the HICFA forms, now CMS 1500 forms. It was like throwing them up in the air and it would rain checks. That's literally how it went. But then things started to happen. And what happened? It was this thing called managed care. And in managed care, insurance companies started to look at what we were actually doing. And as a profession, all too many of us, myself included, stuck our heads in the sand and pretended that it was all just going to go away. Because in my mind, who in there, who would look at signing a contract with an insurance company for the privilege of getting a 30% or more reduction in your fees? That just seemed insane. So I was like, oh, this is going to be a fad. This is all going to go away. And many of us today still practice in, many, much, many, in much that same way, where we think that these changes are just going to go away. They're not going to pertain to us. We ignore it. But as we now know, managed care didn't go away. And to a certain degree, things just got worse. So why did that happen? Well, as recently as 2016, the Office of the Inspector General determined that over 82% of all chiropractic services were considered to be not medically necessary. Eight out of every 10 adjustments was deemed to be not medically necessary. Let that sink in for a second. Medicare also did an audit at the same time their findings were just a little bit better, and they said that about 51% of what we did was not medically necessary. And you think, Medicare, how hard could this be? We have three stinking codes, 9894041 and 42, are the only codes that would apply here. So how, is, how difficult is that? Well, what were they looking at? They were looking at our documentation. And in our documentation, they found that a lot of times we were billing for maintenance care, which we're, we're, we're going to address. Uh, and there was also a high potential for upcoding, which we're going to address that as well. And soon thereafter, in 2017, uh, the Department of Justice, they actually raised the monetary penalty. So for those of us who've been in practice for some time, we know that the penalty for false claims or fraudulent claims when you bill to Medicare was $10,000 per line item. Well, now that fine starts at just under $11,000 and can go up to almost $22,000 per line item, depending upon what it is that was done. Uh, if it falls under the, the category of false claims or under the uh, heading of uh, fraud in terms of waste and abuse of federal money. So 
we have to prove medical necessity. We have to state, what did we do? Why did we do it? Why was it necessary? We had to make sure that you coded it correctly. Was our documentation sufficient? All this stuff that we never had to pay attention to, and we're literally waiting for the next shoe to fall. And fall it did. And we came about with this thing called post-payment audits. And in a nutshell, a post-payment audit, and hopefully it hasn't happened to anybody here on this webinar, but if it hasn't happened to you, chances are it is either going to happen or you know somebody that this has happened to. They are that prevalent. And basically it's a tactic by insurance companies that will extract money previously paid to doctors for services that were rendered. And sometimes depending upon what your state law is or whether the, the audit is done by a private insurer or Medicare, it can go back as far as six years. And insurance company profitability experts state that the results of these audits in terms of refunds back from providers can be even more effective in terms of boosting the bottom line of an insurance company than raising premiums or adding subscribers to that insurance company. It is that significant. And we'll talk about some things that are happening uh, out there so you can at least be consider yourself forewarned. So who can be audited? Literally anybody can be audited. Uh, anybody who's received insurance payments, regardless of whether you're in network or out of network, can be audited. If you're in network, that right to audit stems from your provider agreement. So that brings up a good point. If you are in network with an insurance company, please make sure that you know where that agreement is so that you can refer to it. If you're out of network, the right to audit oftentimes stems from case law or state statutes or other state or federal regulations that give them permission to do so. And cash practices, because I hear this all the time, uh, Dr. So, well, I'm just going to be a cash practice, so I don't have to worry about that. Cash practices are not exempt from compliance with documentation standards because it's oftentimes written to every single state's practice act what minimum documentation requirements are. So it's important that anybody can. Audits can be triggered by a variety of things, could be due to your profile, um, could be a disgruntled patient. Uh, could even be uh, a disgruntled employee reports you uh, to an insurance company. Sometimes your advertising practices or not uh, publishing a, a compliant ad per your state law can trigger an audit. Sometimes submission of claims for care for family members or employees can trigger an audit. Uh, certain insurance companies actually state who family members are and uh, you're not allowed to bill for those immediate family members. I know here in Florida, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Florida will state that your spouse, your children, parents, siblings, even step siblings are not uh, able to be have, have bills submitted. So something to be mindful of. And uh, a very common thing is your random selection. Your number simply came up and that happens quite often as well. So audits are there, they're out there, they can happen for a variety of reasons. And my goal is to make sure that if you do get that little love note, if that audit does come your way, that you can approach that from confidence, not from a point of fear. So many insurance companies are required by law to audit a small sample of providers on an annual basis. So a lot of times those randomly selected providers are gonna get a letter to provide specific documentation and it's typically a small sample. Sometimes it would be somewhere as little as three or four patients to about a dozen or so patients. Make sure that you give them exactly what they're looking for. I like to refer to this as a fishing expedition. They're trying to see who has got their act together and who might be easy pickings for them. When they ask you for, uh, for certain things in audit, give them exactly what they're asking for, but only give them what they're asking for. If you provide them more information than they ask for, that can be subject to an audit and they can take a deeper dive. If you give them less than what they're asking for, they may think that you're trying to hide something and they too will take a deeper dive. And also comply with the deadline uh, that they ask that for. If you have difficulty in complying with the deadline that they ask you for, um, there's nothing wrong with calling them up and asking for an extension that you're it's gonna take you a little bit extra time to get the information together Almost always, they will be happy to extend the deadline for you to comply with their uh, their audit. Um, insurance companies oftentimes will look at something called an audit ranking. And the ranking basically is of the variance between what your annual revenue is compared to that of your peers. Because the difference between where you're at 
and where the average practices are in your area could be an indicator as to what the insurance company might be looking to recoup. So if that sounds like the bigger and more successful your practice is, the more likely you're going to be to be the target of an audit. The answer is, yeah, that is that's likely true. Now, that doesn't mean that you should approach that from fear or purposely keep your practice smaller than it's capable of being. It just means make sure that you're doing a good job with your documentation so that you can prove your medical necessity. So let's talk about a case that's actually going on right now. And as I said, I changed the, the details to protect the guilty. So we're going to just imagine that this case is out of the state of Georgia. It's not. But let's just pretend it is. Everything else after this is going to be completely factual. So this doctor owns a practice that has several different massage therapists that are employed as W-2 employees. And about seven years ago, he discovered that the local police department has excellent insurance coverage for manual therapy if it's performed without an adjustment and if it's prescribed by a medical provider. That medical provider could be either an MD, DO, or a mid-level a nurse practitioner. So he markets to the local police department and he quickly becomes a very nice additional source of revenue. And manual therapy, 97140, alone is contributing over $350,000 a year in revenue from the police department, which sounds pretty nice, you know, but let's see what happens. Since he was ranked as the top biller for manual therapy in his entire state, it made him appear different compared to his peers. So the insurance company took a, a, a peek, they did an audit, and they, uh, dis they discovered that his documentation didn't really uh, fit the bill. Notes didn't match the diagnosis, and the majority of the areas that were worked on by his massage therapist were actually outside the area of diagnosis. So a lot of times they might say a diagnosis of you know, cervical uh, condition or a lumbar condition, but patients were getting uh, full spine manual therapy. Uh, the notes were, the subjective part of the notes were nonspecific. It might just say, you know, headache, or it might say feeling better or tension, things like that. The, there was no signature by the massage therapist indicating that they were the ones that actually did the notes. And if I took a look at the original note template that they were using, uh, it says that, uh, that most of these services were performed many months after the treatment plan had expired, after the prescription from the medical doctor prescribed, uh, that prescribed the care had already expired. Uh, so the argument was made, well, if somebody writes the prescription that says three times a week for four weeks, I'm entitled to 12 treatments. Not so. You're entitled to up to three treatments per week for four weeks inside that 30-day period of time. If the patient only came in for eight out of those 12 visits, then that's the patient's problem. You need to get the prescription renewed. Also, pre-printed on that soap note template, it stated three units of 97140. Everybody got the same number of manual therapy units. That's suspicious in and of itself. The insurance com company, obviously, when they took a look at it, uh, they realized that there was some, some things that were not completely up to par. So they took a deeper dive uh, and they asked for 100 additional files. And they found exactly the same issues with the documentation on every single date of service. And it was determined that most likely it was massage therapy 97124 that was being performed, not manual therapy 97140. And 97124 is not a covered benefit. The insurance company did a six-year extrapolation, and they demanded $2.1 million back from this particular doctor. Uh, the doctor is you know, very smart. He hired a healthcare attorney who understands post-payment audits, and that attorney brought me in to see what could be salvaged. And I did take a look at, at what was done. I looked at the, each of the prescriptions, uh, took them going through the fine-tooth comb, and we were able to... Uh, succeed in establishing medical necessity for one or two weeks of manual therapy for most all the patients. So now that demand for the refund is down to only just under $600,000. This is going on right now, still to this day. Uh, the doctor is no longer taking his documentation uh, lightly, 
and has done a lot of training for his massage therapist to make sure. And as the owner of the practice, he's doing what he's supposed to be doing and looking at and reviewing his documentation from his massage therapist on a regular basis. So we talked about, you know, uh, that we have a pretty simple thing in terms of covered services by uh, under chiropractic, under Medicare. So those are our CMT or chiropractic manipulative therapy codes. You know, and prior to the mid 1990s, we had one code that we had to describe what it is that we did. And that was the A2000. If you look at it, it's not even a CPT code. It's a HICPICS code. Uh, but Medicare did a great thing back in the mid 90s, and they came up with additional codes that allowed us to be able to code for and be paid more for increasing amounts of work that we did. So we have our 98940, which is one to two regions, 98941, three to four, the four two is five regions, and we even had an extra spinal adjustment, 98943. All seems pretty easy, but I like to joke around and say, you give something easy to a chiropractor, we're going to figure out a way to mess it up. So back in those days, Medicare expected that about 35 to 40 percent of the time, what we were doing amounted to as a 98940. About half the time we were doing what looks like a 41, and about five percent or so, it says five to ten percent, I say five percent or less, could be a 98942. So a great question is to ask yourself, how do you, how does your practice measure up with respect to the frequency of those codes being reported? Uh, my coaching clients, we do that on a periodic basis. Uh, and sometimes your software will automatically generate a report that gives you your CPT code utilization on an automatic basis at the end of each month when you do your month end reports. The amount that you vary from these expected norms could, stress that word, could raise the likelihood of your practice getting looked at. And if you are different, it doesn't mean that you should start to change how you're coding. What it first and foremost means is take a look at your documentation. So let's talk about a case. Uh, let's just say it's a Florida case. Um, and this particular doctor practices in an area that has a very, very high Medicare, Medicare population. In his practice, about 85% of his patients are Medicare. And at the very beginning of our coaching relationship, he mentions to me, literally in passing, that he always bills a 98941. Now, anytime I hear that anything is 100% of anything, I want to take a stop and, and, and consider what's going on here. It raises a level of concern. So I took a look at his documentation. I found that literally 100% of what he was documenting uh, in terms of medical necessity came out to an 98940. So I said, well, why is that so? He said, well, I'm a full spine adjuster. Well, hey, so am I. I'm a full spine adjuster as well. And he's like, well, if I adjust an area, that means I should be able to get paid for it. And I go, yes, but no, not necessarily. I said, you, you might need to consider that if you don't have a diagnosis and a history supporting that diagnosis and, a, it, and at least a minor chief complaint, that you're going to have great difficulty in substantiating medical necessity for a full spine adjustment. So you need to consider that part of your treatment might be therapeutic. And part of it might actually be considered a wellness service. So he realized that, that he's got a major problem on his hands. Uh, we generated a compliance activity log for that particular incident. Uh, due to the seriousness of it, uh, I actually had him make a copy of it, send the original to himself certified mail, uh, so that if anything ever came of this, he'd be able to give a sealed envelope that was mailed certified uh, to the auditors so they can see exactly what it is that he did to rectify what the situation was. And the fun for him, of course, continued. And about six months after correcting this, he gets a little love note from Medicare asking for a, a small sample of patients uh, with specific date ranges. And of course, the date range that they asked for was before he made these changes. Medicare, of course, found what it is that I found. They took a deeper dive. They did a six-year extrapolation. And they demanded, could have demanded a refund for everything that he had gotten paid during that six year period. They were nice and they only demanded the difference between the 98941 that he got paid for and the 98940 that he uh, uh, was able to establish medical necessity for. So that amounted to about $250,000. However, because he did a proactive claims and documentation audit before Medicare did theirs. Medicare looked extremely favorably upon this. 
He also implemented a compliance program in his office, which we know statistically has the net effect of reducing penalties by up to two thirds on a national level, because it shows that your intent, even if you make mistakes, it shows that your intent is the right thing. Well, this doctor was able to negotiate a 90% reduction in his penalty. So he had, instead of a quarter million, he had to pay $25,000, which still stung, but a whole lot better than a quarter million dollars. And he was able to survive and, and live to practice another day. So the moral of the story here is be aware that the codes that you're using today can have a very real impact on you and your practice even years from now. So a lot of us have done some great work in integrating electronic health records or EHR systems in our office. And they are awesome at doing a lot of things. They help improve reporting and statistical management, helps improve communication between different providers and insurance carriers. Great for appointment management. We didn't, you know, back when I was in the practice and we didn't have uh, computerized schedules, we literally had to write appointments one by one in a paper appointment book. Um, also, the software programs are, are able to establish certain standards so that you can minimize or even eliminate shortcuts or missteps. But like I said before, give something to a chiropractor, we're gonna be really great at figuring out a way to mess things up. And things happened for sure. So in our profession, I like to uh, take a little step back and use a quote back from the early days of computers, which was GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. And we have to expect that if we put in garbage for our documentation, we're going to get uh, a garbage for our reimbursement. So how does this play? Well, we can all do a lot better and it doesn't have to be hard. And I think that because what we do is repetitive in chiropractic, uh, it is sometimes easy to duplicate our notes. So I want to make sure that we any note that we look at can be looked at as if a real life human being had something to do with the creation of that note. And one of the things is that it's easy as the soap note, all right? And specifically the subjective, the S in soap. One of the easiest things to fix. Let's go beyond just saying, you know, increase low back pain or decrease neck pain. Let's keep it functional. So if a patient says that they're having an increase in their low back pain, ask them, well, what were you doing right before you noticed the pain got worse? What were you doing when the pain got worse? And if possible, use a direct quote from your patient. Patient reports increased low back pain after vacuuming their living room yesterday. Beautiful, juicy, delicious, subjective entry. Or if the patient says that they're feeling better, uh, you know, ask them, well, what were you, what did you, now that your neck pain is less, what do you notice that you're able to do better or differently? Well, you know what? I was able to sit at my computer last night for about a half an hour and I didn't have any of that neck pain and headaches at all. Fantastic, put that in your notes as well. So what that all boils down to is have a policy in your office of not copying and pasting your notes. I, as I said, what we do can be repetitive and a lot of us have busy practices and sometimes it's a struggle to keep up with the documentation despite having some great software. But too many of us have been accustomed to doing that copy and paste and auditors are well aware of this. So make sure, as I said, make sure that your notes look like a real life person had something to do with the creation of that note each and every time. So there's a doctor, uh, we'll say he's from South Carolina and he finally decided that it was time for him to do his own baseline compliance audit on his documentation. He knew he needed to do it, but he'd never actually taken the plunge and had somebody take a look at his notes. So every, he sends me a sample of his, of his, uh, his documentation. He sent me uh, three complete files and I was going through it. And I noticed that every single patient had an awesome 10 out of 10, beautiful first data service documentation. His, his consult, his exam, x-rays, if they were done, everything was beautiful. I turned to the next date of service and it read exactly like the first date of service that the patient presented today, complaining of this or that, that we did a consultation exam, took x-rays on each and every visit. Every visit looked like the very first visit because he was copying and pasting everything. And I approached him on, I said, what's the deal? He's like, well, I'm a busy practice. You know, how do I have time to do that? Wrong answer. You got to make the time to do that. 
a, a vivid example comes out of a practice out in Colorado. And this was a multidisciplinary practice that had a chiropractor, nurse practitioner, a physical therapist. His corporate structure was set up perfectly. One single tax ID number, everybody is an employee working out of that single tax ID number. But because this doctor had a previous history of a post-payment audit failure, he wanted to make sure that what he was doing was on the right track and that he didn't have any things to look out for. So he sends me a sample of his notes. And on the very first file that I opened up, uh, it was clear that on that first day, the patient saw the chiropractor who performed a consultation and exam and did an adjustment. Also on that first day, the nurse practitioner did a consultation and exam, performed three trigger point injections to the patient's rotator cuff. And because the physical therapist was also available on that same date of service, patients saw the PT, had an initial evaluation, received some passive modalities and some basic therapeutic exercises. Patient uh, was placed on a treatment plan that was going to focus at that point moving forward solely upon physical therapy. And we were going to save uh, any other future medical or chiropractic services for a little bit later on in their care plan. That's what they chose to do. Fine. Um, patient was placed on a PT plan of care three times a week for four weeks. So what are the problems that we see here? Well, is it okay that the patient sees the chiropractor and the nurse practitioner on the same date of service? Well, it could be okay to do so. However, chiropractors and nurse practitioners for their uh, consult and exams are both going to use e &M codes. And you cannot have multiple e &M codes coming out of the same tax ID number, the same NPI number on the same date of service. No problem on the physical therapist because their code for their initial eval is different. It's not an e &M code. Um, so that would be the, the issue there that we see. All right. The physical therapist, however, was very busy and used that copy and paste feature built into the software that he had to copy and paste the previous note. But th and this particular software actually cre uh, created the CPT codes and generated the billing driven off those notes. It's a great time saver, but every date of service was copied and pasted from that first date of service for all providers. So every subsequent date of service made it look like the chiropractor was seeing the patient for every date of service for an exam and an adjustment, which they did not receive. It made it look like the nurse practitioner did a consult and exam and gave trigger point injections on every visit, which should have happened nowhere on this planet. And of course, the patient didn't receive those either. And it made it look like the PT did an initial evaluation on every visit. The software automatically build out for all services and somehow, some way, this particular, particular patient's insurance plan paid for all those services. So obviously it was great that we found this. Uh, a refund was made proactively to uh, that patient's insurance plan to limit the risk of a future audit here. And you know what was also very interesting, if anybody's ever tried to refund money to an insurance company, not always the easiest thing to try to figure out how to send money and where to send money back to. Sometimes the insurance company doesn't even know how that should go. Bottom line here, technology can be an incredible tool in our offices, but we need to make sure that we use it the right way. So in taking a look at your notes, imagine that your notes are projected on a 12 by 12 screen in a court of law. Do you like what you see? Do you think that the judge and jury are gonna like what they see? Make sure that your technology can do the best job it can for you by feeding it the best information that you can. So let's take a, take a little shift here and let's talk a little bit about treatment plans. The word that we use here, the terminology is very important. And a treatment plan is not the same as a care plan. A treatment plan under Medicare or CMS guidelines, it should be no longer than a 30 day period of time. It could be shorter than 30 days, but not longer. And it must be written either digitally or on paper and should be able to be easily accessed inside the patient's file. And a patient therefore may have multiple treatment plans inside their care plan. So again, that treatment plan is a 30, no more than a 30 day chunk of time, but a care plan is gonna describe the patient's entire journey in, their, uh, in, their, in, their, in the office. And they may have one, two, three, or even more treatment plans that, that make up the story that is their care plan. So what are the things that we wanna see? We wanna make sure that the patient's name is there, the name of the insured, 
their insurance information, gender, date of birth, name of the provider, NPI of the provider. What are the anticipated modalities that you uh, plan on doing? What are the diagnosis codes? And I would have them written down as they would appear on the CMS 1500 form. What are the pertinent exam or imaging findings? What are the short-term goals? And these are gonna pull off the outcome assessment questionnaires. And those of you who know me know that I'm, I'm a huge fan of outcome assessments. Why? Because they are an ability for us to do an assessment of the patient's ability to perform activities of daily living and will allow us to go beyond just the usual, you know, decreased pain, decreased inf inflammation, increased range of motion type of goals. We can take, we can use, certainly utilize those, but then we can take a look at the outcome assessments and uh, have us write on there what the patient is having difficulty doing. So if the patient says that they're having difficulty in sitting for periods of up to 30 minutes right now, then our short-term goal is to get the patient to be able to sit for periods of up to 30 minutes. Long-term goals, see what the full function descriptor is in that category on their outcome assessments, and that becomes your long-term goal. Make sure that you indicate also on your treatment plan the, the duration and frequency of how many visits per week and for how many weeks. And if you are gonna be sending me an email, I will be happy to send you a, a copy of my treatment plan template that you can either use as paper or scan it into your software. So if the treatment plan is readily accessible to your billing department, you'll find that most of the common requests for additional information can be handled without your insurance manager or your CAs asking the doctor for additional information. And the biller can simply make a copy of or send over the copy of the treatment plan along with any other supportive documentation that they might need and avoid having the doctor having to write reports. That is a beautiful thing, keeps it simple, easy, and streamlined. So let's take shift again. Let's talk a little bit about Medicare some more. Far too many chiropractors are afraid of Medicare. Are there rules? Yup. Are there rules that you should be afraid of? Nope, because they're pretty simple and they're easy to follow. Learn them and you'll have no problem. And my experience is that there's a tremendous amount of misinformation out there that a lot of people don't understand what the rules are and that as a result, confusion is really what reigns. And, there's, and so many people have been doing things wrong for so long without any consequence that sometimes people actually then believe that they've been doing things correctly because nobody's challenged them on this. So as we said earlier, Medicare only pays for three codes. Might this change in the future? We hope so. You know, maybe we can look for some changes in coverage regarding e &M codes, maybe even x-rays in the future. But right now, we got three codes that they're going to pay for. Shouldn't be too hard. If we want Medicare to pay for a service, uh, an adjustment, then we need to put modifier AT, which we will say stands for active treatment. All right. We use this when we think that Medicare should pay for this adjustment. And that adjustment needs to be part of an overall therapeutic treatment plan. A, a, having the patient come in on the first Wednesday of every month at nine o'clock is not a treatment plan. There must be some functional therapeutic benefit that is going to be expected out of that treatment plan for that patient. We have modica, yeah, modifier GA, which for me, we're going to say stands for GOT ABN. I don't know if that's really what it stands for, but we're going to say that that's what it is because I live in this bowl of alphabet soup, having to keep in, keep straight in my mind all sorts of abbreviations and modifiers. This makes it easy to me. So we utilize modifier GA when you believe that care may be considered wellness. And that's where there's no functional improvement expected. Might mean the patient still has pain, but we're not gonna be expecting any functional improvement. And we only use the GA modifier on services that are otherwise covered by Medicare normally. So we only wanna see modifier GA when we're gonna be doing a wellness service for 989 41 or 42. Let's talk about this ABN, this Advanced Beneficiary Notice. And I will say with confidence that this is probably the most single, most misused, misunderstood piece of documentation in all of chiropractic. I hear lots of ways that people utilize the ABIN in their office. Many of them, of them are not only wrong, but could actually render the AP, ABN null. 
So the patient signs an ABN once. When? On the day that they begin wellness care. Do not have the patient sign it on the first visit. Do not have the patient sign it on the first visit and leave the date blank. Do not do that. Do not have the patient sign it on every single visit. That's not appropriate use of the ABN. The ABN is signed on the day that the patient begins wellness care. And once signed, the ABN is now valid indefinitely, but you see a little asterisk next to that, um, or until the patient has an exacerbation or a new condition where they're going to be returning back to therapeutic care, where we would then drop off the GA and re reintroduce the AT modifier. Right now, uh, there, that change uh, that the ABN is valid indefinitely changed on October 14th or just a, uh, about a year ago, just over a year ago. If you look at the bottom left-hand corner, the current version of the ABN uh, as of today expires in June of next year, June of 2023. Uh, what will change in June of 2023? We do not know. Uh, if, it, if past experience is any indication, it could be merely that they changed the expiration date. So indefinitely means that the, you can have that patient sign the ABN and it is valid either until the ABN expires on June of next year or until the patient has an exacerbation. Uh, once we have the new ABN in 2023, uh, it'll probably be valid for a period of about two years and it'll be valid indefinitely as long as the patient remains wellness. All right, the previous ABN expired, as I uh, we said before, on March of 2020. The current ABN uh, uh, was released. The new version now expires uh, on 2023. You can, if you're looking in the lower left-hand corner, I still see that occasionally people are using an old version of the ABN. Go on the Medicare website, cms.gov, and you can get the new version or send me an email and I'll send, it, I'll send you a nice copy of it. This now is one of the most interesting things, and this is modifier G -A G Y. And modifier GY in my vernacular stands for got your version of the ABN. And what does that mean? It means that we're going to use the GY modifier anytime we're going to be reporting to Medicare a service that we know Medicare will not cover. All right. Why are we going to do this? Because oftentimes we want to send it to Medicare specifically so that we can get a denial. And then they will either forward it or you can then forward that denial over to the patient's secondary or supplement for consideration for reimbursement. We're not going to list these statutorily non-covered services on the Medicare ABN. The Medicare ABN is only to be used for those services that are normally covered by Medicare. This we're going to call your ABN and we can call this the voluntary ABN. Uh, and this is a way for you to just list out those services that are not covered by Medicare, what the financial costs are, and this way patients are informed as to the fact that they will be financially responsible. Uh, I have a version of the voluntary ABN, so if you'd like to get my version of it, send me that email, uh, and I'll be happy to email you a copy of it, and you'll be in good shape with that. Uh, we're starting to see a lot now modifier GP, uh, and I'm in a, in a number of private Facebook groups, uh, and I would say almost a, not a day goes by where uh, somebody doesn't pose a question regarding modifier GP. And GP uh, right now is not something that's required universally. Um, it is uh, something that is required by Medicare, which may mean that you have to report GY and GP, double modifier. Uh, and also United Healthcare nationally is requiring this. Um, there are other uh, major insurance companies that are starting to introduce GP uh, on a case by case basis. So you want, you want to be doing is watching your EOBs. What is GP? GP is placed on any time that you have a modality that's performed in your office. So a 97 XXX code. And that means that you're telling the carrier that this service was being performed as part of an outpatient therapy program. <clears throat> Excuse me. This was not a. This is not a modifier that's brand new. Physical therapists have been using this for probably about five or six years. However, this is something that is becoming increasingly seen in chiropractic, so be aware of it. 
when you see on your EOBs that there's a denial for a therapy or a 9-7 code, uh, and the reason for the denial is says either missing or incorrect modifier, that could very well be your cue to start looking uh, at GP as your fix. So let's continue this Medicare conversation. And what we're starting to see now is a huge increase in Medicare Advantage plans. Presently, on a national basis, about 40% of all Medicare beneficiaries are now part of one of these Medicare Advantage or Medicare replacement plans. A lot of these are PPO style plans that may actually allow for in-network as well as out-of-network benefits. Always, always, always verify to make sure that it is a PPO style plan and not an HMO style plan that might not provide for out-of-network benefits. A lot of questions are starting to arise around these plans. And if you're in-network, it's pretty simple. Take a look at your contract with the insurance company and follow their, their rules and guidelines and you should be good to go. But what if you're out of network with those plans? What does that mean? Well, if you're out of network with a Medicare Advantage plan, what can you do? Again, lots of misinformation. You know, first you want to see uh, is to see if any Medicare beneficiary, you must, must, must be credentialed either as participating or non-participating with Medicare. PAR versus non-PAR with Medicare is very different than PAR versus non-PAR with private insurance. In private or commercial insurance, if you're participating, that means that you're in network and you've credentialed. If you're out of network, it means that you've never credentialed with them and you're going to hopefully take advantage of out of network benefits that might be available there. With Medicare, PAR and non-PAR really refer to how and who pays you. As a participating provider, you're going to bill Medicare on behalf of the patient. Medicare is going to pay you directly. If you're non-PAR, you've credentialed with Medicare as a non-participating provider, and you can then bill on behalf of the patient as a courtesy. The patient will pay you directly, and Medicare will reimburse the patient up to the limiting charge for your area. But if you're not credentialed, then you are nothing. And while there is some debate as to whether this is true or not true, I uh, always err on the side of, of caution. And I, I say that you're prohibited from treating any Medi Medicare beneficiary. You know, but things will get a little bit muddier if, as we take a look at how Medicare Advantage plans come into play. All right, so if you are going to be uh, a, a either uh, in network or out of network with an, a Medicare Advantage plan, First, you need to credential as a provider under traditional Medicare, that red, white, and blue card. Next, if you're going to be in network with that Medicare Advantage plan, as I said before, follow the Medicare uh, Advantage plan rules. If you're out of, Medi uh, out of network with the Medicare Advantage plan, then the patient is going to pay you directly. How much? Well, that's going to depend. If you are a participating provider with traditional Medicare, then you can collect up to 100% of the fee-for-service rate for your area. The Medicare Advantage plan will then reimburse the patient up to 100% of the fee-for-service rate minus any copay or coinsurance that the patient might be responsible for. All right, and this refers only to statutorily covered services, that is the adjustment. If you're non-PAR, then the patient can pay you up to the limiting charge. And the limiting charge is equal to up to 115% of the Medicare allowable for your area. All right, so check with your local Medicare administrator because it's going to vary, uh, can vary you know, quite a bit from region to region around the company, uh, around the country. Um, so you can collect up to 115%. However, the Medicare Advantage plan will reimburse the patient up to just 100% of the fee-for-service rate minus any copay or coinsurance. Super important distinction to be making here. So here's a little flow chart. Might be a little bit tough to see on your screen perhaps, but um, here Medicare Advantage PPO style plan comes in to see you if you're a participating provider and on a national basis, all about 97% of all providers in Medicare are credentialed as participating. I have plenty of clients that I work with that are non-PAR, and that's perfectly okay. So if you're PAR with, with traditional Medicare, patient's going to pay no more than 100% of the fee-for-service rate, 
and the beneficiary is going to be reimbursed up to 100% of that fee for service rate, less any coinsurance. If you happen to be non par, which right now on a, on a national level is about 2% of all providers in Medicare, patients going to pay you up to 115% of your limiting charge, right? But the, uh, the PPO style Medicare Advantage plan will reimburse only up to 100, 100% of that fee for service rate. If you are nothing. Now, chiropractors cannot opt out of Medicare. Medical providers can. So if you are nothing, right, then you cannot see that Medicare patient. If you have a Medicare provider in your practice that uh, has opted out of Medicare, then they can enter into a private agreement with the, uh, the patient. There's no limit as to what that medical provider can charge. Again, chiropractors, this column here does not refer to us. So remember, DCs cannot opt, not opt, opt out of Medicare. If you're out of network with the Advantage plan, you can charge your regular fee for non-covered services. Uh, the only services covered by Medicare, as we said before, the 40, 41, and 42. And if you're not credentialed with traditional Medicare and you're seeing Medicare patients on a quote cash basis, stop, stop now, stop it today, and change that. All right. Uh, right now, credentialing with Medicare is super, super easy and super fast. Um, it used to be up to a 90-day pr uh, process to get credentialed. Now we can get credentialed uh, in, it takes about four weeks, but I am hearing from people that it can even be as little as two weeks, but certainly within a four-week period of time. Not a reason not to do it. So if you want to take care of Medicare patients and 10,000 people every day in this country are becoming Medicare beneficiaries, that's a huge segment of our population. And if you wanna be able to have access to them, credential. It's not hard, nothing to be afraid of. All right, shifting gears here, something else that's starting to, uh, to come on the radar uh, is counting therapy minutes, All right? Make sure that you understand how to count therapy minutes when appropriate. What, what codes do we have to worry about counting time for? It's any nine seven code that is numerically 97032, which is attended electric stem or higher. The first unit does not begin until we've completed eight minutes of therapy. Can you do something for less than eight minutes? Yes, but it would not be billable. Of course, you need to document it, but it's not billable. The second unit doesn't start until at the end of the 23rd minute. The third begins at the 38th minute. So if you're billing a single service for less than eight minutes, not billable, still document. If you're billing multiple services of time codes or multiple units of a single time code, then we need to calculate what is called total treatment time. So calculate the total amount of time for all the codes that you've performed today that, uh, that require a time code, and that will re allow you to determine the number of units that you can bill. So let's just say as an example uh, that we did 10 minutes of manual therapy, 971140, 10 minutes of therapeutic exercises, 110, and eight minutes of ultrasound, 97035, which many people, that might be an eye opener for you uh, because a lot of people don't know that ultrasound is a time code. So what's our total treatment time? It's 28 minutes. This falls under the range of 23 to 38, which is just two units of that time code. What do we bill for? Here we're going to bill for one unit of 97140 and one unit of 97110. Why? Because those are the two codes that we did the most of. <coughs> Excuse me. That ultrasound code is not billable, but it must still be documented. Uh, and you must also include, if it is ultrasound, uh, make sure that you include the time, the intensity, and the region that you perform this on. So we covered a ton of information. Was this hard? No, it's not hard. But what it really does is it, it, it's going to really involve us taking a step back from what we're doing, pay attention to what we're doing, and realize that what we're documenting, or even more importantly, what we forget to document, can have a very real impact on your practice, not only today, but even years into the future. Bottom line is let's pretend we're Nike. Just do it. It's simple. It does not have to be hard. 
If you have questions about anything that I covered today, please feel free to reach out to me. My phone number here, that's my cell phone. You can call me directly. I'll be happy to schedule a little bit of time to, to meet with you and discuss and answer any of your questions. And if you would like the notes and the little goodies that I referred to, such as the voluntary ABN, that your ABN, as well as my treatment plan template uh, and the notes for today's presentation, send me an email to Dr. Jeff Lewin at Gmail. I will be very happy to send that over to you. Uh, no cost, no obligation. It would be my pleasure. So Christy, that's it for today. Uh, are there any questions that we need to take care of? Uh, just one question. Where yes. in the Medicare regulations do you find that a treatment plan can be no longer than 30 days? So that's something you got to, we got to take a little bit of a deep dive. And I'm, I, I will tell you, I don't have the chapter and verse in CMS guidelines, but I will be very happy to provide that. I see who's asking it. I actually know who's asking that question. So I will be happy to, to locate that and, be, and provide that. And if I can do that in the next little bit, I'll include that uh, in my email response to everybody when I send out the notes. Yes. Hi, Dr. Short. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's the only thing that we had. So I was just going to let y'all know that we have a webinar next week um, with Don Rasmussen. It's going to be claiming the employee retention credit. Are you um, at hot audit risk? So, um, Make sure you check that out at coverhealthusa.com forward slash webinars. Mm -hmm. Get registered. I see another question just popped up. Yep. It says here, if, you have, if you're treating a patient full spine and they only have one region of complaint, can you build a 98940 for the region of complaint and then uh, submit a the uh, physical medicine wellness code, the S8990 for maintenance for the other regions? And I would say that the answer to that is, from a, a legal perspective, yes, I think you, you can do that and you can charge it. Uh, the real issue then really becomes one of patient and financial management, and that is, can you do that? And if you can build up the perception of value for what you're doing and be able to charge a fee for the other services that are considered wellness, by all means, feel free to do so. All right. But you're correct. If there's only one region of complaint, you can establish medical necessity for that 98940, a one to two region of adjust adjustment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, but said, uh, said simply, you know, if the patient comes in with headaches and neck pain, you can have the patient, uh, you can uh, adjust the patient's cervical spine and probably their upper thoracic and have no difficulty with medical necessity. Adjusting the patient's lumbar spine and even sacrum, pelvis, uh, while I, I can quote chapter and verse on that closed kinetic chain and from a philosophical perspective, say why that that's an important thing to do from a medical necessity standpoint, doesn't work. So we can't do it. I, you know, it's so funny. I think anytime we talk about billing, coding or documentation, that question comes up. Always. Always. And it's so funny because I just know that my child is going to be one of those when he gets out of chiropractic school, he's going to be like, but I adjusted the full spine. Why can't I bill for it? You know, if it's a wellness service, knock yourself out. Right. Otherwise, you can only bill the insurance company what it is that you have medical necessity for. So, all right, everybody, that's a wrap. And we will see you here next week, same time, same place. You're watching the recording just now that when you type your questions into the chat box, they come email directly to me. I'll share this with Dr. Lewin, or you can just email him at drjefflewin at gmail.com. Reference that you saw him on this webinar today when you submit your questions so he can get an answer back to you. Thank you so much for taking an hour out of your busy days and spending it with us today. And we'll see. My, my pleasure. Anytime I look forward to doing it for you in the future.